Okay, hi everyone and welcome to our second webinar on the topic of research transition to operations and applications. This is Dan Barry and um, today's webinar is going to focus on the transition efforts um, and give some examples of successful transfers of scientific research to operations. So um, transition is a, a, a significant element of NOAA's function and doing this effectively has long been an agency concern. Our program, the Modeling Analysis Predictions and Projections Program, has worked closely with partners over the last few years to ensure that effective transition takes place. And transition can constitute many different types of products, techniques, and other outcomes. Today we're going to focus mostly on, um, on transitioning new forecast techniques and modeling routines into operations. Last week's, last week's webinar focused more on the programmatic issues and organizational issues related to transition. And today we're going to hear from three speakers who are supported by the MAP program. We're going to hear first from Sarah Liu, who is at the University at Albany. Um, we're going to hear from Mike X second, who is at the NOAA Environmental Modeling Center. And finally, we'll hear from Cecilia DeLuca, who's at the NOAA Earth System Research Laboratory. So uh, we'll start first with Sarah. Sarah, are you on the line? Yes. Okay, great. I'm going to transfer control over to your computer. All right. And then just share your screen with us, please. Okay, looks good. Whenever you're ready, go ahead. All right. Uh, thanks for this uh, opportunity. And I'm going to talk about the uh, global aerosol modeling system and NSEP, which is really the direct outcome of uh, those you know, research R2 programs. Um, so the next slide, uh, this is uh, an amazing from this model and was showing the 2013 late summer in the national news to talk about this uh, Saharan air layer. And this same event was reporting local news later the week to talk about the uh, impact of air quality and then also the increased, uh, uh, increased number of people get sick during asthma attack. So in the Brian Williams report, he actually linked with dust on the suppression of hurricane season. And whether we know this or not, not sure, but you know, the long range dust transport and its impact on air quality and public health is clearly shown. So, and then the, aer the aerosol modeling system I'm talking about, the NANS and NANS GFS aerosol component. And this is a successful example of how we transition NASA's research to NSEP for operational application. And this initial implementation was supported by NASA Applied Science Program. And this is our first global inline aerosol system. And this is built upon the NOAA Environmental Modeling System, and which itself is actually based on the common modeling framework, use Earth Science Modeling Framework. Uh, I believe Cecilia will address this, this uh, effort here in this webinar. So the initial implementation we have was implemented in December 2012 and provide five-day dust forecast. And the model is uh, the AG sends the NSES NANS version GFS and the aerosol components from NASA GADA, uh, the aerosol NANS, uh, the model NANS go card. And we have the T126 is about one by one degree resolution and vertical is 64 layers. And two Establish new capabilities, really multi-agency collaboration, and we have the ENC team work here, and the June 1 is another project point of contact. But the NAS, the software engineer team lead is Mark Arido, and we have many EMC colleagues contribute on very, very aspect of this modeling system. Like Mercy, he's working not just physics, he also work on dynamic code, and then, so it's really team effort here. And we have the several external collaborators and many um, primary collaborators from NASA GADA. And Orlando DeSalva have been working with EMC through initial implementation and all the subsequent upgrades. And then the Shoba from the NEST have been very, very helpful to enable us to do a full aerosol forecast, which I'll address later. And I joined university last September. So I'm now it's an external collaborator for this whole project here now. And so why we include aerosol in the prediction system is really the most important aspect from the weather center is actually aerosol's impact on radiation and cloud. So by probably a for just effect, um, we have potential to improve weather forecast and climate prediction. And also we do need those aerosol information during data simulation. 
So the first two items actually fundamentally to support the core mission for NSEP, which is the weather and climate. And then at the same time, you know, global aerosol forecast system was, will be able to help our regional air quality system by providing boundary condition. And last uh, rationale is uh, just by able to produce quality three-dimensional aerosol information, there's a lot of uh, potential application to address wide, wide range of uh, societal need and uh, stakeholder requirement like UV index, air quality, Etc. So next one is I show this is a, a naturally solar energy work done by my uh, SUNY colleague. And then they have a radiated transfer model and then consider cloud and then use this to produce solar power prediction. And then they can do all the way to 10 kilometer or one kilometer. So this panel you can see is a typical AOD uh, pattern. You can see the dust and pollution, those kind of events. So another in addition to aerosol, other factors also affect solar radiation, solar energy, like how much cloud and ozone and weather well location elevation. So this this bar chart showing, you know, if you have base case, which means without all this inference, that's how much the downwave show, show show wave radiation you could have. But if you double LD, you actually can substantially reduce uh, how much solar energy available. And if you perturb other other component like a precipitable water, ozone, altitude, you also reduce solar energy. But from this chart, at least we know errors was one of the most uncertainty and certain factor and also have a lot of impact on how much solar energy available. So this is one nice example to show the application for the, our aerosol focus capability. And the aerosol modeling traditionally is actually been done a lot of very exciting work by the regional air quality community and the climate community. But recently, we see a lot of development at the operational center. So those aerosol forecasts now is available from several centers. And then we all build upon the existing modeling and simulation system for our meteorology system. So you can see from Navy, European Center, UK Met Office, and God on Earth, we, have, we all have different aerosol modeling capability. And then last piece, Two centuries, you know, we actually talk about exactly the same goal cut on different AGCM. So this is really an NSA and the GALA's collaboration and research to our personal project. And the aerosol module we talk about here, as I mentioned, is the inline version. So it's a lot of scientific advantage. It's more consistent. And from the uh, software engineer aspect, it's more efficient. But most important aspect, for us to able to account for aerosol impact on cloud and radiation, we just have to do like we just have to do an inline approach. So in that sense, the transport mixing are done on the AGCS. So the aerosol module only consider the aerosol module here with dust, sea salt, and sulfur and black carbon, organic carbon, and we only consider the very simple source and then removal and then some very simple emission and removal process and very simple chemistry. So, and as I mentioned, we are not only centered through the aerosol forecast. So there's, uh, we do have the global aerosol forecast working group, uh, including several operational center and the data provider from that, like NASA, Lenly, GADA, and then the European counterpart as well. And then we actually, at NSET, leverage the collaboration with other uh, war experts in the operational aerosol forecast. So we do have the, the Navy, they put together a multi-model ensemble. And for this slide showing here is uh, actually from the Sunday, so two days ago, and then focus from the seven members, thus AOD from seven members who produce operational global forecast. And then you can see the dust plume evolve with, uh, it's the integral with time. And then as we're looking forward, a lot of activity and the initial implementation was funded by NASA to bring the GOCA into the NSEP for the dust forecast. But there's a various program is helping us to transition more advanced research, continue to improve this forecast research capability. The first one will be we the joint center from, from the NASA and got on us to work together to develop near real time biomass burning emission. And that allows us to put to allow us to do a multi-species aerosol prediction, 
and that was uh, scheduled to be implemented late this year. And then this full aerosol, prognosis aerosol capability is first step to uh, do aerosol gas simulation. And the third advantage is uh, doing is we actually start looking to aerosol impact on medium medium range weather forecast. And then at the same time, we're looking more detail about how aerosol cloud radiation interact, interact with NSAID global model. And last one, we start to hook with the uh, global aerosol model output with the original system. So there's a lot of activity going on, and then there's a, we are fortunate enough to have several different programs to facilitate those activities here. And I would like to show two examples about those activities here. One is the Joint Center found, the, uh, found us to work with uh, Gata and the, well, I was with EMC before, so at that time it's EMC, NASA, Gata, and GMAO. And it's a multi-agency collaboration to develop a near real-time balance burning emission. And then this emission is implemented this, this month by Nestes. So this allows NSET to upgrade the uh, NGAT model into the full aerosol forecast. And then, as I mentioned, this is our first step to allow us to do aerosol data simulation. So, and this is showing the the biomass burning emission is actually blended from NASA's the geostationary estimate and the MODIS polar orbiting from NASA GADA. So you can see that these two different set of instruments bring, bring different advantages. Like polar orbiting provide high latitude information and geostationary give much better temporary resolution. And then with this emission, we was able to simulate the, the sulfate OC and BC and allow allow NSA to produce four aerosol package. So this is showing the, on top panel will be the global ensemble from other center, and this is will be OC, AOD. And the bottom will be the, the NSA models, AOD for the same time. And you're talking about actually different aerosol model and different, different emission estimate, but at least you can see uh, the NGAC, the latest model target for implementation just capture all the evolution of those, uh, the biomass burning prune quite well. And then another project uh, is also part of example of how the R2 benefits its aerosol modeling capabilities funded by Climate Testbed, and that's to improve cloud microphysics and their interaction with aerosol in the NSET global model. And that's a collaboration between NSET, GARDA, and SUNY. And again, this is a really multi-agency collaboration. We try to improve the representation of aerosol process, cloud microphysics, and how they interact. And the proposed upgrade is to bring the NASA GARA physical based aerosol and cloud microphysics package. And this package in turn is based on NCAR uh, climate model. So this allows us actually tapping the broad research community's effort here. So, and this project contributes not just improve the aerosol representation aerosol cloud interaction, but it's really contribute to the development of the advanced physics package in the NANS. So it's close aligned with the NWS R2 O initiative. So it's a lot of engineer work for this project, and you can see we're going to bring NASA's microphysics scheme and aerosol scheme and how aerosol and cloud interact. But for the rest of the model, it's a lot of technical work and requires very close cooperation between this, between the GADA and SUNY with the EMC team about how the aerosol new microphysics interact with coupled with microphysics and with the rest of the convection and moisture process. So it's a lot of exciting things going on, but you know, I'd like to address the, the global aerosol modeling capability at NSAID is be established through a very close collaboration among EMC and NASA GARDA and NASA scientists and universities. So my personal experience learning from this project is you know, this actual is accomplished from, you know, we have the system to do concurrent co-management through version control. So all our co-development was committed to NSAID code repository, and all the tests was based on EMC's uh, parallel in infrastructure. And then we use, utilize the uh, Earth system modeling framework in NANS. But this top two, Two lesson I mentioned here is, is partly from the software engineer aspect, but it's from the management, programmatic management aspect. It's actually the 
the EMC's engagement is very important because that was able to, we was, the project was able to understand the operational requirement, constraint, all the way to the very start, beginning of the project, and that will avoid any surprise down the, down the line when you really, really good transition to operation. And the last one I think is very, very important. It's really not just our kind of to O. It's really we continue to engage between both sides to ensure very close communication and coordination between R and O throughout the whole transition process. So it's really what, you know, the, the university, those agencies, EMC, work closely throughout the whole process and for the very smooth transition to answer for operational application. So, you know, looking forward, the multi-agency partnership is very important, and that's the way we can ensure the sustainable system development and NSEP. And then also the transition of research capability from NASA to NOAA for operational implementation has been facilitated by several application-oriented programs. And we start from NASA Applied Science Program, but Joint Center has been very, very helpful to enable us to move forward to a full aerosol package and plus the subsequent aerosol designation activity. And also the max CTB is being you know, very, very helpful to allow us actually advance model representation of the how aerosol tag with cloud radiation. So let's go ahead and thanks a lot. Great, thanks a lot, Sarah. I think that was a really nice example of the type of work that's required to do this. Um, and I want to add one note, which is that uh, on our website, on the MAP website, we do note different projects that have transitioned um, either to some type of application or into operations. So please, you know, explore our website and you can find a list of all the projects that have transitioned over the last uh, couple of years. So um, we have some time for questions now. So if anyone has a question on the WebEx, please go up to the green bar on the top of your screen, click the participant list, and then at the bottom left-hand corner you should see a logo to raise your hand. And then I'll know you have a question and I can unmute your line. In the meantime, are there any questions in the room here for Sarah? Okay, no questions in the room here. So, Sarah, I'm just going to give it a couple seconds and see if anyone raises their line, uh, raises their hand online. And then also, in the meantime, um, we're supposed to have Mike X speaking next. And Mike, if you can hear me, um, I'm not able to unmute your line right now, so please do log out of the WebEx, log back in, and make sure when you log in that you enter the attendee ID number when you call into the phone line. So hopefully you can hear me. Uh, we may have to skip your turn right now and go to Cecilia next and then come back to you at the end. Okay, Sarah, I'm not seeing any questions, so thank you so much for presenting. Thanks for the opportunity. Okay, great. Um, so Cecilia, are you on the line? Yeah, I am on the line. Hi, do you mind um, going next? Nope, that's fine. Let me uh, just set up. Okay, sure. Let me know when you want me to pass the control over to your computer. Sure. Why don't you uh, Why don't you go ahead and do that? Okay. okay. Can you see my screen? No, not yet. You just have to click the Share My Desktop button. Find the Share My Desktop button. Sorry, Dan, I'm not seeing that. Okay, are you in WebEx right now? Yes. Okay, um, so do you have a quick start tab in the window? Not. Alternatively, in, if you're in the event center and you go to the menus at the top, there should be a share menu. Oh, great. <laughs> Okay, great. It looks good, Cecilia. So whenever you're ready, go ahead. So I'll be talking a little more generally about the, some of the tools that our team, uh, which is the NOAA Environmental Software Infrastructure and Interoperability Group, um, offers for uh, R2A, and Sarah already touched on some of them. Um, so as a sort of a broad overview you know, when we think about R to A or, or O to R, um, you know, what are the what are the objects that need to be passed back and forth 
in order to make this happen. And, and some of those objects are model components and data sets and metadata. It's useful to be able to transfer um, scripts and workflows between the communities. It's useful to be able to pass diagnostics between the communities. Um, some of the actions that, that actually make R to A happen are you know, goal setting, joint goal setting, joint prioritization, software code development, um, model intercomparison and analysis is, is really important um, when you have more choices. Training is really important. Um, and then there are you know, uh, activities like program review and even organizational code development. Um, some of the assumptions and, and some of the mechanisms that enable these, these things to happen are enabling infrastructure access to code and information and, and a supportive communication and organizational structure. And what I see when I look at this slide is, is the ways that infrastructure really touches on almost every one of the items on here. So as we go through the slides, I'll, I'll try to pick out where I see um, the, the infrastructure that our team develops affecting these elements of, of R to A. So the Earth System Modeling Framework is, is you know, our kind of flagship product, and it offers standard interfaces for model components and an architecture for model construction. I and mean, what this really does for R to A, especially since it's a community-developed set of com component interfaces, is that the, the broader, a broad set of people understands, I think, the requirements for integrating research components with operational components. And, and this allows multiple groups to contribute components to, um, to couple development and an operational system. And that's a, a really powerful capability. So I think many of you maybe have seen ESMF component interfaces before, but they're really quite simple. I mean, ESMF components have three standard phases, initialized, run, and finalized. And each method um, has the same interface, which is basically a pointer to the component the fields in, the fields out, and a clock. And so this, you know, this is something that I think a, a very broad community of modelers has come to understand as something that works um, under many circumstances and, and can be used to support um, really very complex systems. The interfaces are wrappers, and they can be introduced usually in a non-intrusive way, uh, meaning that the model code inside um, the, the code that scientists see usually doesn't need to change very much. Um, and ESNF is designed to coexist with native model infrastructure. So we can wrap it around, for example, um, a, a component like MOM5 or MOM6 uh, that uses uh, a different infrastructure package without needing to remove that other infrastructure package. And that's a powerful capability, too. Um, ESMF offers grid remapping for coupling. And I won't go through all of the things that it can do, but these sort of flexible and fast remapping tools are important because they support data transformations that enable new components from the research community to be incorporated into operational systems. So if, you know, if there's interest in uh, a bunch of different um, dynamical cores, for example, like MPAS or FIM or um, you know, a, a variety of different ocean grids, what this enables you to do is to basically take those grids and couple them into the, a, a, a system by doing grid transformations that, that turn them in, that, that um, transform the data into uh, grids that other components can understand. So this is also important for creating distributed systems with, um, with a broader community. Uh, NWAPSI is a, cap is, a, is a consortium of operational weather prediction centers and their research partners. And NWAPSI added to ESNF, um, it's almost like a, a set of tinker toys. There are prefabricated model components um, that serve specific functions. So there's a template for a driver. There's a template for a coupler in the middle. Um, there's a template for connectors that move data back and forth. And you can use a lot of code that's already been written here to build up systems quickly. And this is great for testing. Um, and it's great for being able to support multiple configurations. And this is important for, um, for being able to uh, take a, a complicated system with many components 
and perhaps simplify it um, in a research context. You might not want to run seven components. You might only want to run two components. Um, so, so this is also uh, an important capability. Uh, specifically, this MOPSI interoperability layer adds on top of ESNF um, you know, more precise definitions of interactions during initialize, run, and finalize the generic components that I just mentioned. It also introduces metadata conventions. So it introduces a field dictionary based on the climate and forecast convention. And that ensures that there's some semantic mediation. So you can go between components um, based on standard names and, and making some automatic um, making some uh, automatic connections in, in the coupler. There are also uh, com compliance checking tools. Now that's those are super important um, for being able to use this kind of infrastructure easily because a researcher who wants to produce a component that's compliant um, or a research team usually that would want to produce a component that's compliant needs a way to be able to check that they're doing the right thing. And so we've been putting a lot of energy into these tools lately to make sure that, um, that people will be able to do that. And I'll talk a little bit more about this Cupid uh, integrated development environment, which is um, a training environment and a development environment that should make using this system a lot easier. The ESPS project um, is uh, it, it's sort of a multi-organization, multi-agency thing where a, a bunch of groups got together and that that are all using this NUOPSI, um using these NUOPSI interfaces and. You know, we're sort of starting to look at these as a pool of components that's, that's a national asset, really. The, the components here are limited to a few types. So it's really just, at this point, atmosphere, ocean, wave, and sea ice. Um, but there are a number of different organizations that uh, are making these kinds of components available. So there are a number of different atmospheres, a number of different oceans and waves and sea ice that all have the potential to be um, incorporated into the same application potentially for testing or evaluation. So CESM, the NEM system, MOM5 and HICOM, the Navy global and regional model, uh, GS5 and Model E uh, increasingly are following these, um, these uh, uh, conventions. So this is a chart that shows across the top some of the systems that I just described. And on the left side, some of the different components within those systems that are NWAPSI compliant. So you'll see a list of atmospheric models and a list of ocean models. And the, the point here for R to A is that the many community and federal models that are available with NWAPSI interfaces, you know, increasingly I think will allow operational centers to leverage and test a variety of components more easily. So um, you know, if, if the operational team wants to test the sea ice model, you know, it's already basically got a NWOPSI interface that allows it to be dropped into the code. And it's not a trivial exercise to connect those models up, but it's also not as hard as it used to be because the interfaces are at least technically compatible. Okay, this is shifting gears a little bit. Um, this Earth System Framework Description Language is an NSF-funded effort that recognizes that, you know, this NUOPSI and, um, and ESNF framework, it, it's, a, it's a high performance framework. It focuses on really Fortran applications for the most part. And domains like hydrology and agriculture, um, it, they don't necessarily use the same kinds of codes or coding standards. So this ESFDL is a forward looking initiative that um, aims to describe and understand infrastructure software. So it, it kind of creates a taxonomy of infrastructures and especially uh, coupling infrastructures with the idea that um, that kind of an understanding can help to eventually connect these infrastructures. So what we're looking toward here is, um, is applications where the, the, the models um, that are in use uh, at federal centers and in operations ultimately may need to be connected to models that are far more local 
and far more application oriented and um and it's it's an effort to analyze ways that that might happen um with more choices in the model components that you can have model intercomparison becomes um a very uh, a critical activity so we developed infrastructure for supporting model intercomparison and this earth system cog environment has supported national and um, international projects it supported a couple of rounds of the dynamical core intercomparison project in 2008 and 2012 we're supporting um HIWIP. Uh, the open data initiative is being the um, access to uh, information is, is through cog and we're also getting set up to support um, CNIP 6, as well as, as going back and redoing the CNIP 5 website. So the things that we offer for model intercomparison are um, a configurable search to data set, so you can set up the data access the way that you need it in order to, um, in order to do comparisons of the model output. It provides a project space for the project and sub-projects, so you can easily set up a wiki project space and give each of the participating teams their own space in that environment. It also supports the organization of complex networks of projects, so it was easy, for example, for the, the DC MIP folks to set up a main project with um, their uh, periodic sub-projects or like DC MIPS 2008 and 2012 under a parent umbrella. And importantly, it also provides uh, links to services for Earth System Model metadata collection because if you're going to be combining, um, if you're going to be comparing uh, really complex modeling systems, you, you need to have a way to describe what you're comparing. Otherwise, the, the comparison probably is not going to be that, that precise or robust. Um, so for efforts like CMIP5, there were major metadata efforts to, to try to capture um, not just the, the model uh, data outputs, but also model description. So those tools are also available through, through POP. So a little bit more about the metadata. Um, this is a this ES doc effort that we we co lead um, is really primarily led by an, an EU group, <clears throat> and there are a bunch of tools associated with it. So there's the first thing that's associated with it is the um, the schema for the the the, the um, all of the the pieces of the description. Um, there's a questionnaire that our team developed. There's a viewer. <clears throat> that shows the information in a really nice format. There's a comparator where you can um, create tables of, of uh, the information about each of the models and output those in convenient formats, and there are searches. So that's a, a really nice capability as we go forward with different models at play to try to, um, try to compare them in a, in a systematic way uh, using sort of modern infrastructure. And there's, there's a little example of the ES document. And again, this is customizable. So, for example, the DC MIP project could focus, could really focus just on the dynamical cores and the aspects related to the dy dynamical cores, whereas the CMIP project, you know, has tons of different components, um, and you can work through the questionnaire component by, on a component by component basis. Okay, shifting gears one more time. I think I have maybe another minute or two. Um, this Cupid development environment is a tool that's designed to make adoption of the modeling framework faster, easier, and more appealing. And importantly, you know, it provides a streamlined training environment because in order to reach people, you really need to get them interested. You really have to make it an, an easy process. So what Cupid does is it gives you basically a GUI, um, and it's based on the Eclipse IDE, which is pretty widely used. So there's you can see all the files that you're working with. You have a code editor. You have a um, over on the right. You have an outline of the code, 
where the 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 tool automatically pulls out kind of the, the code structure based on what Nwapsi calls it finds. And then on the bottom, you have um, you have a command line where you can compile and submit jobs and things like that. So again, you know what one of the things that this can do is process and a, a set of <coughs> model files and generate for you an outline of what the code looks like, what all the components are, what where you can find the initialize and run and finalize phases and what those phases are. And this is really nice, I mean, because you can also use the outline to direct you over to those phases and it will show you actually because it knows what's required for NUOPSI where there are compliance issues and it can even suggest for you what you should do in order to address those compliance issues. So it will do some code generation and say, you know, here I think you need to identify how many processes how many processes you're running on. That that information is required. <laughs> so this is a powerful tool that's been in development for a few years now and um, we had a, a first release this spring that I think we'll be trying to push this out. <laughs> And make it more widely available uh, over the next year or two. So all of this infrastructure—not um, well, I shouldn't say all of this infrastructure, but, but many pieces of this infrastructure are being used in the coupled NEM system at EMC. Um, as you've heard in this webinar and many other webinars, you know many community models are coming in, um, and I think we're we're really trying in the NEMS project to take advantage of as many of these sort of modern infrastructure techniques as we can and make <clears throat> a really strong connection between the, the operational center and, um, and the rest of the community. So I think I better stop. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Cecilia. Any questions here in the room for Cecilia while we wait to see if anyone has questions on the WebEx? Okay, if you're logged in virtually, just raise your hand in WebEx to let us know if you have a question for Cecilia. And you can do that by going to the green bar on the top, go to the participants um, tool, and then on the bottom left there's a hand logo. If you click that, it'll let me know you have a question. I can unmute your line. Okay, uh, there is a question from Ken Mitchell. Ken, are you on the line? Yes, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Please go ahead. Cecilia, uh, referring to your last slide, and also to the slide you had before the one labeled ESFDL, my question is, um, you haven't shown land models as a separate uh, entity. Uh, Wharf Hydro has a land model. Um, I know Stan Benjamin's group and Ezra must have interacted with you on this issue, but can you, and in your last slide, under global atmosphere, you have a land in parentheses as if it's considered part of the atmosphere model. Could you address that? Yeah, sure. I think Mike could probably address it better than I can. But historically, um, land models have frequently been um, structured as subcomponents of, of the atmosphere. And, um, you know, that makes a certain amount of sense because of the frequency of, of of interactions between land and atmosphere that needs to be efficient and that's a way of making it efficient. Um, however, I think we are, I think there is a, um, a desire and an emerging plan to pull out land um, and make it a separate component. Um, exactly how that's going to be done I think is a little bit up in the air. <laughs> um, there are questions of course, of performance, there are questions of what the driver would be, there are questions of how it would relate to land data assimilation and so on. But I think that that is the path that, that people are currently exploring. Well, good. I'm glad to hear it, and I would encourage that path, and there's certainly strong reasons to have a separate land module. Uh, an, another uh, group leader who might be very interested in this issue to work with you would be Krista Peters Ladard's group at uh, NASA GMAO, uh, as well as, of course, you mentioned Mike Eck, and he'll, hopefully he'll be speaking next. But thank you for your answer, and I hope, I hope that uh, land uh, initiative within this project moves, moves ahead. Okay, 
Yes, and we are we are partnering with Krista on a number of of um, of other projects as well. So we do have a, a pretty close relationship there. Good, good. Thank you. Yes. Thanks for the question, Ken, and please remember to put your hand back down in WebEx. Um, Mike, are you, are you on the line? I don't know if you wanted to address that or follow up on that comment and question. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, it works. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I think Cecilia did a good job, and thanks, Ken, uh, for your question. And, and I think we know we've talked about this before, and there's certainly a lot of details to iron out with uh, you know, fast physics versus slow physics, and land has its own fast versus slow kind of physics. So, um, I mean, the devil's in the details, how you can get the things to connect and, and you make it efficient. Um, if it's something where you have to do an atmospheric component, you've got to immediately feed it to the land and then the flux is added back up to the boundary layer and so on. So um, there's certainly some things to sort out. But land in and of itself is, is certainly worthy of a, you know, um, I guess uh, it, it's kind of owned standalone in a sense. Um, because there's a lot of things that we're moving into that are more than just kind of the boundary layer fluxes kind of thing with groundwater and river flow and so on. But maybe those are sorting themselves out by faster versus slower physics. So we shall see. Okay, great. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, and I'm happy we're able to, to we were able to sort out the phone line issues. So it's great that you're able to join. Yes. Thank you. I'm not seeing any other questions now from the WebEx community, so I think this is a good uh, transition. Cecilia, thanks for the talk. Really appreciate it. Sure. Um, so, Mike, I'm going to transfer control over to your computer, and we'll give it a shot of you sharing your screen, if that's fine with you. Yes, that is. That's fine. Okay. So, I if am you're now on... the presenter. Oh, that's so great. Okay. Continue. And do you see the Share My Desktop button? Uh, yes, click it. Yep. Okay. Okay, great. Okay. And if I go to my PowerPoint, say? Yeah, we'll be able to see it. Okay. Can you see it? Uh, yeah, it looks good. Whenever you're ready, go ahead. <clears throat> okay, very good. Um, this is definitely a research to operations and transition kind of project, and it was moving the North American Land Data Simulation System and LDAS into an uh, NTEP operation. Uh, there's a lot of folks here that are listed as, as the co-authors, as hey, you rightly should be, and there's a lot of other uh, collaborators in earlier phases of LDAS. It, it really um, took an effort to develop and test all the forcing data sets, the land models, and so on, and the real big thing we, we have here is 30 plus years, and it will be more in our next phase, of um, reanalysis from the land, if you will, uh, but running the land model for a long time. So I'll get more into that in a minute, but um, you can see the whole host of people working in here. And uh, I'm glad to hear Ken's on the call. And you long you're there as well? Oh, well, anyway, I'm assuming you long is, is on as well because, oh, he gave me the number. Right. So moving on, you can see that uh, you saw, you, you've seen I'm on number two. Let's see, Dan, can, can you talk to us? Yeah, we can see your uh, second slide. All right, all right, so I'll just assume everything's fine. So um, motivation, the overview of the NLDAS, uh, the background, what are the components, what are the products, and where are we going to go in the future? Um, obviously, the motivate, one of the major motivations is hydrological extremes, and drought is one of the big things, broadly speaking, water resources, but drought is, is very important. And we know we've identified meteorological drought, basically your lack of precipitation, agricultural drought, where um, crops are affected, so that's a kind of a soil moisture thing. And then hydrological, where you actually have, you know, all the uh, runoff that goes into the streams and rivers and so on you know, how that is affected. And there's different time scales uh, of these things that are going on. It's certainly spatial. So I just kind of grabbed a little definition from Wikipedia. On the other side, there's, there's, the, uh, there's the flooding. Um, that can be a, of course, very interesting flash flooding episode. It can be, um, well, I put to a picture of the Colorado flooding in 2013 when I chose to take a vacation and show up in Colorado the day it started. 
So that was a very interesting thing. And there was certainly lots of flash floods in that regard. But I think in terms of flooding and what we do, uh, the, the interesting thing with an LDAS is we provide initial conditions or evolving conditions of the land state. So as we know, flooding is dependent on how much the, the um, soil can absorb and how quickly. So uh, having these antecedent conditions described is very important as well. So we certainly fit the extremes and then everything in the middle and knowing what the resources are that we uh, are very interested in terms of water. So if we look at the pieces of what an LDAS is, we have four land models right now, NOAA, SAC, VIC, and Mosaic. And they're run in an uncoupled mode, and that means they don't interact with the atmosphere. We use atmospheric forcing to actually drive the model, so the evolution of the surface fluxes, the evolution of the land state. And we get that forcing from the Climate Prediction Center's observed precipitation product that's gauge-based, but then it's radar or satellite disaggregated into a temporal um, time series because you really want to know what's going on on a, on a diurnal cycle. That's very important. And the atmospheric forcing comes from the NSEP North American Regional Climate Data Simulation System. That's the real-time extension to the uh, North American Regional Reanalysis. Um, the output is land and soil states, surface fluxes, and runoff and stream flow. Uh, land and soil states, soil moisture, soil temperature, um, snowpack, uh, uh, and fluxes, as I said, runoff and stream flow are part of that. Um, what we do in running these models since 1979, um, we haven't been running them since 1979, but we ran them uh, from that 30-year period with a stable climatology uh, from a climate model, so things aren't evolving uh, in, in terms of the system. So what you can do then is run it with this stable climatology of forcing, and then you, you determine the climatology for the land model for this 30-plus years. And then what you do is you cast the anomalies and percentiles. You cast the conditions compared to the climatology in terms of um, anomalies. And so you can characterize, well, just how, you know, anomalous is this, dry, wet, whatever. Um, and this supports the U.S. Drought Monitor, the National Integrated Drought Information System, and a, and a lot of other people uh, and groups. So this just is a snapshot that shows the 30-year climatology of uh, in July over CONUS. Um, and, uh, I mean, the bluer, the wetter, the, the, uh, the well, the... I guess grayer, redder, yellower, um, the drier. Um, this is in terms of just purely volumetric. So, and then if you cast things in terms of these anomalies, the, the 88 drought period shows up quite well. Although you can see there's definitely some pattern to that. And areas were, um, you know, some areas, even in the southwest, you look at New Mexico, is wet. On the other hand, if you look at the 93 flood period, you remember that was in the, primarily the Midwest, but there was a there's a part down in the North, North Gulf Coast, especially Texas area, that was still wet um, and then dry between that. And actually, the East Coast was rather dry during this period. So these are some things that are, that are quite useful in terms of the monitoring and drought monitoring for us to actually be able to characterize in a nice, quantifiable, um, objective way. Um, also, I show up the 2011 drought as well. You can see just how broad it was over Texas. I mean, we could show it 2012, which has a very interesting character as well. But notice how um, during 2011, there was a fair amount of the country that was very much above uh, normal in terms of the um, so much anomaly. Um, this is the website I show right across the top where NL Bass is. And this is a four model ensemble of the monthly soil, uh, soil moisture. Uh, total water soil moisture. So I mentioned uh, this became operational in NSEP in early August 2014. And I'll, I'll mention uh, that the research is supported by the Clim Climate Program Office. Um, uh, thank you for that sponsorship. Uh, and earlier um, versions of the Climate Program Office, its name has changed. Our major partners are NASA, Goddard, uh, Office of Hydrology, which is now the National uh, Water Center. Princeton University, University of Washington, I mentioned them, but we've had other uh, folks involved as well the, that have helped with uh, model development as well as an LDAS problem. So going on to the next slide, here are, is a more detailed list of all the partners we have um, at the various places. Um, I will mention, um, uh, let's see, oh right, you can see my mouse. Uh, the partners at UT Austin and NCAR are our primarily our, our NOAA 
looking down at the NOAA land model, uh, partners in development, but we have other people on that as well. Um, the operational transition, uh, Yu Long Xia, who's on the call here and can answer questions just you know quite as easily here, is the one that really was the workhorse in putting these things together and in the uh, uh, into operations, which there was a lot of uh, a lot of process to making that happen. Um, uh, King Simo and others at CPC and elsewhere in, in I would say the drought community. Um, are the ones that very much use our products for their monthly drought briefings at CPC and droughts, um, and outlooks. Uh, but of course, the Drought Monitor Author Group, National Integrated Drought Information System, which I mentioned before as well. And again, I mentioned uh, under the MAP program, it's currently, but previously supported under pro other programs to move this in operations. So let's go on to the next slide. Uh, just a little history, just mentions this is very multi model, our multi agency and institute, very long term. Collaboration. The, the nucleus of these ideas started pre-2000, but gradually gained momentum and evolution in terms of what do we need to do, what's useful. Um, and LDAS-1, which was our previous version, was kind of a test phase of this where we looked at can we move this along for several years, and then we determined do you really want to make a difference in terms of climatology and so on. Uh, in terms of drought assessments, you need, you need a, a long-term period. And 30 years is just kind of um, you know, scraping the edge of what uh, they would, what what people would like. But nonetheless, it gives you some important information. Um, so there's definitely connections to say the climate test bed, hydrological, hydrometeorological test bed, and so on. Um, and I just um, highlight here a um, uh, an overview of the NLDAS uh, uh, article um, led by. Uh, Yulong Shia, but there have been a number of things that have uh, have been done in that regard in terms of the model development, testing, and so on by multiple authors, several people on this call. Um, looking to the components, let me just give you a, a few specifics. I mentioned the NOAA land model. It kind of has at, at its background um, um, uh, NCEP modeling and elsewhere, and actually the NOAA is in the warp. Uh, Mosaic on the on the on the uh, NASA side as well. Um, it's an older land model. We'll talk about that in a minute. And then from the hydrological community, we come from uh, the SAC model, which is the operational uh, model for the Weather Service, um, and then the VIC model. And just contrasting these things, kind of more on on the left side is, is from the op comes from the operational setting, and more on the right comes from the more research setting. But nonetheless, they all have something to offer, and they bring a very nice uh, multi-model ensemble into this system. So. Something else that's very important for us to have is uh, various data sets to be able to drive these, not drive the models, but the models need to know, you know, what's going on at the surface. Because certainly you have forcings, um, wind temperature, humidity, precipitation, extremely important, and so on. But you have to know what is the surface type, what's the vegetation type, what's the soil type. Um, over deep snow, what do we expect the albedo to be? For example, uh, the, the deep snow albedo is much lower because trees sticking through in the boreal forest regions, for example, up in Canada and in the Pacific Northwest, are going to be darker looking than what you would get uh, if there was a deep snow over the plain. So that's very important for representing the energy budget right, which, uh, um, of course, the energy budget and water budget both interact. So green vegetation fraction, what is the, um, you know, how, how green is the vegetation Say for a given grid box or um, a location, um, is it fully vegetated or is it is it mostly um, bare with just um, with just you know early emergence of vegetation in the spring? That's very important for partitioning partitioning our service energy budget and then of course determining you know how much might be transpiration versus how much is bare soil evaporation or direct evaporation. Again, very dependent on what's going on in the different soil layers. Um, Snow free albedo as well. What do we expect? What do we expect albedos to be? You know, some subtle variations again with large amounts of incoming solar radiation can greatly affect the surface energy budget. So in this case, we use fixed climatologies in some cases, um, like vegetation type and soil type. Although vegetation type will even evolve over over time, um, near real time um, measurements like the green vegetation fraction. We're now working with a product that has a near real time now that, that will change um, you know from from season to season and uh, your vegetation may be uh, ahead or behind of some climatology and so I may even mention that some quantities may be assimilated for example snow and soil moisture so 
So through a more sophisticated assimilation process, we ingest those into the model. So we have um, a better a better land condition. So moving on, um, the atmospheric forcing, as I had said, comes from um, the regional climate data simulation system, or the NAR, I call it the backbone, and then the CPC gauge based of observed precipitation, but that's temporally disaggregated, and I'll repeat this because this is very important, using of some satellite data sometimes. Um, you really want to know what's the diurnal cycle of this, and you can't say just divide precipitation evenly. And so all of these things that are going into an LDAS involve a real effort to develop um, whether it's the, the data sets we're using or the forcing data or or how do we make this diurnal cycle and so on. Um, bias corrected with PRISM values, um, PRISM is um, the precipitation um, uh, algorithm to try to get a higher resolution in, say, mountainous regions of what precipitation is. And so that's very important. Bias corrected solar radiation as well, um, uh, spatially and temporarily varying because that's second to precipitation. Um, and I'll just, this is a snapshot that shows just shows some initial conditions, just to, to um, bring home the point that precipitation, solar radiation, wind speed, pressure, specific humidity, downward long wave radiation, and air temperature are, are the driving fundamentals behind that. And then you have greenness and land, you know, land use, vegetation type, soil type, and so on. As we change versions of the model, some of these things may become forcing as well, like the green vegetation fraction in a model that has dynamic vegetation may enter in there. Uh, moving on, um, uh, I won't go into great detail here, but there's been a, there's been a lot of validation of the NLDAS components um, so we can feel you know, good about what we have in, in terms of how the model is, is, is operating. Energy fluxes using power data, um, for example, looking at the net radiation sensible latent heat flux and ground heat flux, the water budget, evaporation, total runoff, stream flow, and so on. Um, soil moisture, skin temperature, soil temperature, snow depth, and snow cover. And so these are just some snapshots of examples looking at soil moisture anomalies, looking at stream flow anomaly correlations. But, you know, there's a whole lot of things behind that um, that are uh, validating these efforts and uh, validating the models, and these efforts are continuing. Um, uh, just to show the NLDAS product website, we have uh, the NLDAS website that's maintained by Goddard, and uh, you can go there and get forcing data, forcing data, output data, and so on. Um, actually, they have more than just the NLDAS, they have the global land aid symbols as well. I'll jump over to the uh, NLDAS uh, website, and they kind of mirror each other. Um, that's actually an NCEP that shows the drought, uh, the U.S drop monitor if you're, or I mean the NLDAS monitor, and this is a drop down menu and you get soil moisture, evaporation, snow cover, and so on. Um, there's a forecast compo component that's still in a research mode where we're using the, GF the CFS forecast to drive um, uh, an ensemble prediction of some of the land state variables like stream flow and soil moisture and so on, um, and we'll continue to be de developing that. And here's some very nice statistics um, that Oops, no, let me see. Oh, I'm sorry. This is also on, um, on um, USGS on their geodata portal um, um, or advertised. So here's some very nice statistics from um, uh, from NASA that just showed how many distinctive users we have, how many downloads we have, and the volume of downloads. So this kind of information is quite useful. Um, we run into many people that are very interested in our forcing data, our land data, and so on. Uh, I went to Texas a couple of years ago for a drought forum, and I had some nice introduction slides all about NLDAS, and by the time my talk came around, it had been, it had been shown four or five times. So it's, it's very well used. Um, other people that are using the, uh, the, the 12 kilometer, or the eight degree, excuse me, the, yeah, eight degree, excuse me, um, forcing data sets uh, from NLDAS for various applications. So this can only increase and become more important as uh, we, we say improve the land models and we uh, uh, get higher resolution and extend the domain. So here's uh, some FTP sites uh, that has this information as well, but I guess everyone will have access to these slides later. Um, just some more products and users. I mentioned CPC drought monitoring and drought outlook, the U.S. drought monitor, 
the U.S. Drought Portal and the National Integrated Drought Information System, NIDIS, other users, academic, private, et cetera. So just a kind of a snapshot of some of the big users, but uh, we thought certainly that there's a lot more than that. Um, and here's just some other examples from NCAR CDC Disease Center for Disease Control. Soil moisture is very important for, you know, um, for vectors and um, for disease vectors. Drought indices here, of course, from CPC. We work with uh, Princeton and Michigan on uh, on these efforts as well. So again, some snapshots of some users. I like to show this one because this is a nice uh, animated time series for uh, on a weekly basis of the soil moisture anomalies, March 12th to December 2013. So showing the evolution of the 2012 drought period in the central U.S. that it evolved. Uh, and you can see that quite well. And it should repeat as we get near the end of the year, but you can see how the intensity increased. But then there's various places where it, it subsided a bit before maybe reintensifying. You can see the California drought near that end of that period when it was very strong. Um, jumping to another um, product, looking at actually the stream flow. This is very interesting. You'll see Hurricane Irene go up into the northeast of the U.S., and then you'll see later Tropical Storm Lee come into the Gulf Coast, Louisiana, and work its way up to the Appalachian. This is very interesting because soil moisture and the anomalies for stream flow, and, you know, kind of hydrological matters, um, it's, it's very important to know what the antecedent conditions are. So if you look at how Trop or Hurricane Irene went into the northeast, very wet. Everything went above normal, but then you had Lee come in following behind that, and the anomalies went very positive and, and big again in the Northeast. So again, this is characterizing the antecedent conditions of the soil moistures were going to increase quite a bit, and as a result, the stream flow. So this is the, this is um, the stream flow anomalies um, again gridded um, over the uh, over the U.S. Uh, and an, an initial uh, attempt to look at getting uh, hydrological components in, in our in our couple of models ultimately. But I'll go to the future. Right now, we want to extend our current NLDAPs to run under NASA's land information system. Actually, that's that's done by NASA, and we're moving it into NCEP right now, in, into the EMC development group. So what's nice is we can run in a parallel processing environment. We can use the latest version of land models, and there's also data simulation and validation tools as well. The thing about parallel environment and um, parallel processing is the fact that we can do our 30-year reruns in, in a very, um, a much more accelerated way. We want to make a change to the forcing data. We want to make, you know, the forcing data climatology. We want to see how changes to our land model behave. We can run it in this parallel environment a lot more quickly. So that's a very nice architecture that we could run under. Other improvements, um, say precipitation improvements, uh, going high, higher resolution, we're going to have to worry about downscale and so on. Um, outside the CONUS domain, we, we can worry about, uh, I mean, we can use some products from CPC, um, but uh, that have evolved um, such that there's higher resolution on a, on a daily basis of such product. Uh, better land data sets using VIRS, the new VIRS greenness vegetation product. What does the land surface look like as opposed to using a climatology? Very important if you want to get that surface energy budget right because if you have a lot more or a lot less greenness, that's going to be a lot more evaporation or a lot less, which will affect the heat budget, which affects the connection with the boundary layer and the growing boundary layer. Subsequently, um, in a coupled setting, that could be very important as well. But even in the offline setting, um, that's going to affect your evolution of your soil moisture. Um, I mentioned land data simulation, snow and soil moisture, two of the things that we're working on right now. Um, model physics upgrades for example, to include, say, vegetation dynamics, including carbon, so maybe CO2-based photosynthesis, um, vegetation that actually grows um, over, over a season as well, uh, include the effects of irrigation so, and, and, uh, and uh, human management of water. Um, under the land model physics improvements here, I would say that uh, this, is, um, this is our NOAA MP land model that, that we're working on right now that has those and other uh, upgrades. Higher resolution and downscaling are absolutely necessary. So we're going to want to make, especially the precipitation products, higher resolution, but you bring in terrain effects uh, or, or topography, that's really going to be important to represent how those forcing variables change, you know, even, you know, funneling of winds and valleys and so on. Um, 
that higher resolution than when we are in a coupled model setting would allow us to still have what we need in terms of understanding what's going on at high resolution for land, feeding to the hydrological community, but then being able to upscale, upscale to what we could provide the atmosphere. So higher resolution downscaling, um, enhanced land model spin-up procedures. Uh, we don't want to necessarily spin up using one year that happened to be a drought year. So there's some sophisticated things that Jairi Dong in the land group has done in that regard that, that have uh, helped with spin-up procedures. I mentioned um, Yulong, Yulong's objective blended NLDAS drought index, which is a blend of so soil moistures and runoff and evaporation to come up with an objective uh, blend for a drought index, um, um, perhaps being extended in the future to include the effect of snow because that has some sort of temporal lag as well. But nonetheless, using them objectively so that they can be repeated. Um, finally, we want to extend the domain um, and the resolution, higher resolution for first North America and then global. I will say we do have our global land aid simulation system, but the idea is to merge things into one high resolution GLDAS, and then we can serve the needs for um, feeding the best initial conditions to the atmospheric yeah. models and connecting with hydrology and um, um, and then continued uh, drought products, water resources. Um, finally, well, I did mention this initial conditions for these coupled models in the Bezos scale model, the global model, and the seasonal forecast model. And finally, really um, solid connections with any kind of hydrological production. And the reason I'm here in Tuscaloosa is because I'm at a hydrological program manager's meeting at our new uh, national water center. So we want to make those connections solid. So that's all I have. Thank you very much. Nice. That was great. Thanks a lot. Really nice overview of uh, NLDAS implementation and, you know, the impressive range of products that it informs. So thanks a lot for, for doing that and for calling in from travel, too. So, Quite, um, a team. Quite a team. <laughs> team <too. laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, big team effort, definitely. Um, so we are a little bit past three, but uh, I'll see if there are any questions on the WebEx. Please use the hand raise feature. Um, and uh, if there are any questions here in the room. Yeah. yeah. Hi, Mike. This is Anarita. Hello. Hi. I have a question. You, you mentioned uh, uh, the connection with uh, potentially the NOAA Water Center, and uh, since you mentioned you're actually there uh, to, you know, discuss this type of application, can you can you elaborate a little bit on what you see, you know, being NLDAS applications uh, potentially for use in the NOAA Water Center? and uh, potentially needed development, uh, developments in the future of NLDAS to satisfy those needs? Well, you know, we're sorting that out. But the, the one thing we don't want to have is, you know, independent systems. And so the, the, the primary people that have been working on this between NCAR, the Water Center, formerly Office of Hydrological Development at Silver Spring, but Dave Coach is at NCAR, Brian Cosgrove at the Water Center, formerly OHD, uh, the NASA group, Crystal peters Ladard. Um, as role in, in Boulder is, is definitely involved as well. The thing we want to do, and the, the vision I think is, you you want to you want to be able to handle the global to the regional to kind of the watershed all the way down to the street level, and that involves different partners. Certainly down to the street level, that's that's kind of not our mandate, but that that's interaction with uh, say FEMA ultimately. Um, but what 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 I see is a, as using, say, NLDAS as a backbone for the, the, the land model part that we need, and then working with the water center, we get to the resolution they need to do really substantial hydrological modeling. You talk to a, a hydrologic, you talk to a land, an atmospheric model, and they say you have 12 kilometers, you know, in your in your model, and if you have it, say, globally, well, okay, that's a pretty resolution, that's pretty high. You go to a hydrologist and they did 12 kilometers. Oh, my word, that is so coarse. So we, we kind of have to balance, you know, someplace in the middle. And that actually brings up Cecilia's comment or question about um, a separate land component. So maybe that could be running at a higher resolution, upscaling to feed what we need for the, um, for the atmosphere, to, for the global model, but then getting at the higher resolution and subsequently, you know, downscaling whatever is needed for stream flow to operate on maybe sub-kilometer scales, not maybe, probably, 
to operate on sub-kilometer scales to provide what you need for a lot of information on the hydrology. So I, I think NLDES is a bridge, and this is, a, this is what we definitely talked about when we were at, um, uh, there was kind of an overview meeting in Boulder when we were kind of hammering out all of these things. So we're going to want to, we're going to be working very closely, and all the principles involved are, are understanding that we have different um, different pieces of this to put together. But by no means are we going to go down any kind of stovepipe path. That's not the way to do integrated Earth system modeling. Thank you. Great. Thanks for the question, Anna Rita. So I don't see any other questions online. So Mike, thanks for the presentation. Thank you, and th thanks, everybody, and thank you, uh, you Long and Ken, for being on the call, too. Yeah, definitely. And uh, just thanks to all three of our speakers uh, for taking the time to present today. These are nice examples of successful transitions to operations. And um, uh, thanks to everyone for logging in. We're going to have our next webinar on June 9th, and the topic is Drought Understanding, Monitoring, and Prediction. And we're going to have four speakers in that webinar, so it'll be an extra 15 minutes. Uh, it's actually planned to be an extra 15 <laughs> minutes, unlike today. Um, we're going to hear from Martin Hurling, who's at the Earth System Research Laboratory at NOAA, Amir Agokuchek, who's out at UC Irvine, Tom Delworth, who's at the Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Laboratory, and John Nielsen Gammon, who's at Texas A&M. And it's going to really cover a nice span of, of you know, the different drought efforts, understanding drought better, predicting it better, and monitoring it better. And we got a little flavor of that already today. Um, and also, the California drought will, will come up in at least one of the talks. So uh, hopefully, everyone comes back in June. And um, this. Uh, this today's webinar is, has been recorded, and we're going to put the recording up on our website hopefully in the next couple of days if you would like to send the link or see a part that you missed. So thanks again, everyone, for joining, and um, hope to see you again in June.